All right, got it. We are recording now. Uh, my name is Micah Herskind. I am um, a policy associate at the Southern Center for Human Rights. Um, not officially representing Southern Center here, but we're here to just talk a little bit about Cop City um, and sort of what that plan is, what its impact would be, um, and how people who are interested can get involved. Um, so to go back um, in September 2021, so almost a year ago now, um, the Atlanta City Council voted yes on a plan to basically cut down and destroy 85 acres of Atlanta's South River Forest um, and replace it with a new police training center. Um, this would be a large and pretty elaborate um, facility that would really focus on police uh, militarization tactics. It would include um, a mock city where police could train and you know, work out different tactics. So for that reason, organizers who sort of rose up to resist this project referred to it as Cop City. Um, and you can see this is sort of their um, rendering of what, um, you know, of what this land might look like. This is all forest land right now. Um, and of course, you know, the rendering makes it look green <laughs> still. Um, but make no mistake, you know, the, the goal is to cut down a lot of forest land. Um, and I want to note quickly that, you know, this land is really significant, not just because it's a forest, but also because it's home to the old Atlanta prison farm. Um, and so if you haven't heard of the old Atlanta prison farm, basically this is land that was used from about the 1920s through the 1980s um, to force incarcerated people who were incarcerated by the city to produce crops and to work on projects for the city. Um, sometimes they were even forced to build their own, you know, cages and cells. Um, and so this land really kind of has a dark history in the sense that, you know, post slavery, disproportionately black people were, you know, um, incarcerated and forced work on this land um, for the city. Um, so just to fully contextualize this plan, um, when we think about, you know, the, the police training center right now, you know, what you'll likely hear from proponents of the plan is that their current police training center is really, um, you know, broken down and has a lot of, you know, issues with the building. And that's really true. Um, and advocates, you know, who have been fighting against Cop City fall on different places of should they, you know, should they refurbish it? Should they build a facility in a different place? Um, should they not build a new one altogether? Um, but what people are, you know, sort of in agreement on is that it certainly does not need to be built on this site. Um, and to give you a sense for sort of how big this facility would be, um, it would be a bigger police training center than that of either Los Angeles or New York City, um, despite Atlanta having, you know, a significantly smaller police force. So this is really a colossal investment in policing that would be made. Um, and we're gonna talk more about the impact in a second, um, but just briefly, I wanna say that if this, is con if this is constructed, Cop City would destroy much of the forest and green space on this land um, and replace that space with a big and noisy and environmentally toxic police training facility. Um, and it would really wipe out this forest that's pretty key to preventing flooding and preventing climate disaster. I mean, I think we all feel how hot the temperatures are this week. Um, and the idea of it getting even hotter with less coverage, I think is really scary. Um, so I just wanna quickly talk a little bit about the how behind sort of how this plan got passed in September of 2021, um, because that itself shed some light on exactly why we should oppose the plan in my view. Um, so when it was first proposed, a huge range of organizations came out against the proposal. So people marched, um, they did direct actions, they circulated petitions, um, there were protests outside of council members' houses, um, they canvassed neighborhoods across Atlanta and especially in the area of unincorporated DeKalb County where the facility would be built. Um, and they even brought in national attention. Um, I think maybe most significantly, you see in the bottom right-hand corner, um, there were whole neighborhood associations in Southeast Atlanta that came out against this facility. I think um, I at least think of, you know, neighborhood associations as generally not like very political actors in the sense of taking really public stands around, you know, around something like a police training academy. And they came out and said, you know, this is a bad idea. Don't destroy the forest you know, please, please don't move forward with this plan. Um, the campaign brought together police violence, activists, environmental justice organizers, anti-gentrification and housing justice groups, um, youth organizers, um, and like I said, even some of the more typically apolitical organizations, just this really broad group of people who said no. Um, I'm just checking the chat. Okay. 
um, and, I'll, and I'll definitely circle back to these these questions. Um, so the, the 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 proposed location is um, in this in the the area of the old Atlanta prison farm. It's on Key Road. Um, it's also the Entrenchment Creek Park Forest area, um, and it's in unincorporated the Cab County. Um, so when it came time for the final vote in September 2021, um, you can see on the screen organizers mobilized the public, you know, the metro Atlanta area, people in DeKalb County, people in you know the, the city proper, um, to call in and voice their and voice their opposition. So we ended up with over 17 hours of public comment, um, and that was about 1,100 callers, um, and several of us did a tally as we were listening to these these 17 hours of calls. And what we found was that about 70% were anti-cop city. So they were against the project. They were saying, please don't do this. Um, and about 30% were calling in support of it. Um, but within that 30%, what breaks down is a pretty clear set of demographics, which included um, police officers, firefighters, and people who identified themselves as living in the Buckhead or North, uh, Northwest or Northeast Atlanta area for the most part. Um, and if you know anything about Buckhead, you know that in a lot of ways, it is sort of the heart of the white economic power structure in Georgia. It's where a lot of corporations and CEOs are based and live. Um, and most recently, they led a secession effort, which, you know, looks a lot like white flight efforts that we've seen, you know, that we've seen in the 50s and 60s and that, you know, we continue to see today. Um, and so that's who called in to support it. The firefighters would also have some space at this training academy. Um, wow. And on the other hand, yeah, did someone else? Oh, good, good. Nothing much. How's it going? Could you all mute, maybe? There we go. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then on the other hand, you had people calling in from every district in the city, um, and particularly people who were calling in from the area closest to the site who were saying no. Um, and I just want to point out, you know, there was this one really notable comment as we were listening. Um, an older Black woman called in from near their proposed area, um, and she said, quote, the police don't protect us, they protect the north side, but you want them to train over here. Why is that? Um, and I think we know that the answer is that, you know, some of these places like Buckhead and some of these corporations want all of the policing, but they don't want to have to deal with, you know, the really toxic impact of such a massive facility. Instead, they want to put it in an area that is poorer and not as white as their community is. You know, that's where they want to put this facility. So despite all of that opposition and so many people coming out against it, um, when it came time to vote, there was almost no discussion among city council of, are we gonna pass this? Are we not going to? Um, and all but four council members voted in favor of it, um, including our current mayor, um, Andre Dickens. And so I think, you know, while we would all probably like to believe that if a community speaks so resoundingly against the proposal that our council members would listen, um, unfortunately, that was not the case here. Um, and there are so many reasons for this. Um, I can share some articles if folks are interested, but one thing I just want to point out because I think it um, is indicative of some of the power structure behind pushing forward this proposal um, is an e I, I want to show this email from Dave Wilkinson um, that he sent in June 2021. Dave Wilkinson is the, the chief uh, the, the, he's the CEO of the Atlanta Police Foundation. Um, the Atlanta Police Foundation is a private, you know, entity that supports the police here and, you know, raises money for them, raises technology for them, that sort of thing. Um, and he sent this email to um, a, a, a high up staffer in um, Keisha Bottoms' office, the, you know, then mayor at Keisha Lance Bottoms' office. Um, and I won't, you know, I won't read it out. I just want to highlight a couple of things. Um, first, he says that he knows from a previous conversation with this staffer of the mayor's office um, that council members are looking for a cover. So he knows that council members know that the people are against this proposal, right? But he says he understands they're looking for a cover. They're looking for a reason to do it. And so right there, we can see like something's not right here. If we are living in a representative democracy, why are our council members looking for a cover to do things that they know the people they represent do not want them to do? Um, and in this email, um, he, he says, I'm including an email, I'm forwarding an email here um, from a, a CEO of a major company who lives in Buckhead. Um, and this is that email that he forwarded. Um, and you can see that this Buckhead-based CEO says, the current situation must stop ASAP or I and others will have to turn all of our support 
towards the Buckhead City movement. And this is about building Cop City. Um, and so I want to, the reason I point this out is because this is a real threat of white flight here. This is a real threat of we're going to take our white tax dollars um, and we're going to leave the city and leave you and take all of our resources with us if you don't do what we want and build this cop city. Um, and so I just think that's really important to notice when we think about the, you know, the power dynamics of this. We have a whole community coming out against it. And then we have a couple of really well-resourced people who are speaking in favor of it. And that's who our elected officials ended up listening to. Um, all right, I've got nine minutes. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's an overview of sort of the plan, what it is, you know, how it came about, what, what they plan on doing. Um, and probably a lot of that speaks for itself and, you know, why we might want to oppose it. Um, but I want to highlight a couple different impacts um, that I think are really pressing and really urgent um, that give us a real reason to, you know, to take a stand and take a stand today against this thing. Um, so the first is an environmental justice standpoint. Um, so we know that climate change is happening. We know that, you know, we're seeing increased frequency of, you know, various climate disaster events. The West Coast is on fire. The East Coast has, you know, is flooding and has hurricanes. And, you know, we, we see all these disasters all the time. Um, and one thing that I've learned in the past couple of years is that forest land is really key to both preventing flooding because it provides sort of a runoff area for water to go. Um, and it's also really crucial for mitigating hot temperatures. Um, and so from the, the USDA, they, I learned there that the cooling impact of one healthy tree um, is equivalent to 10, uh, uh, the, yeah, the cooling impact is equivalent to 10 room size air conditioners operating 24 hours a day. So our trees, you know, play a massive role in cooling the area around us. They're really crucial to bringing down temperatures. Um, and so raising a forest um, is only going to lead to increased temperatures at a time when, you know, I saw that we just had record, um, record heat projected for this week. Um, and so to me, that is really scary as someone who wants to live in a habitable world and, you know, maybe have kids who will also have a habitable world, habitable world to live in. Um, and, you know, I, I think that probably everyone on this call knows, um, but I was reading recently that one of the results of um, redlining when, you know, when they broke up neighborhoods of, you know, and, and you know, segregated neighborhoods, basically, you know, unofficially um, was that, that urban planners planned for trees to be planted more frequently um, in, you know, in white designated areas, whereas areas that were majority black have far, far less tree coverage. And so you see higher temperature uh, higher temperatures in majority black areas. And this area of DeKalb County that surrounds the forest um, is a higher population um, about black community there versus, um, yeah. And, and so, you know, when we think about tearing down a forest in this area, you know, we are contributing to environmental racism. We're, you know, accelerating climate injustice and climate disaster. Um, and so that's sort of the first point in terms of the impact. Um, the second is that we know this would increase police presence in the area. This is going to bring police in and out all the time. Um, we know tragically from you know headline after headline that more encounters with the police lead to more deadly encounters with the police. It just increases the likelihood of a deadly encounter. Um, at the same time, it's going to give space for cops to train and really perfect some tactics of repression on people, especially protesters. So if you followed any of the 2020 protests, we saw people, um, you know, peacefully protesting in the streets and getting scooped up by cops and taken to jail and, you know, being beaten and really being hurt by these officers. Um, and this, this proposed facility would have a mock city in it where cops can, you know, train and learn these tactics on people who are, you know, being, you know, expressing civil disobedience um, or, you know, carrying on the tradition of protests and, and free speech. Um, it also has international implications because we know that that you know police agencies from all over the world will come to this facility to train, um, and so this you know this facility will only further militarize the global police force. It'll bring you know tactics from other countries into the U.S. It'll spread U.S. tactics across the world. Um, it really has international implications. Um, and then the last thing I'll say before I just turn to sort of what can be done and sort of what what you all can hopefully do. Um, 
is that this is a, a quality of life issue for the people who live in the area. When you have a police training center with you know, a helicopter, uh, you know, a helicopter landing pad and people shooting guns all the time and bullet casings, you know, going, going and seeping into the dirt and polluting the dirt. Um, you know, when you have an increased police presence, people driving in and out all the time, um, that's just going to impact the people who live there in a really negative way, even though we know those same people are not going to be protected by the police. Um, and so there's really, you know, impacts on so many different levels. Um, these are just a couple, I'm sure you can think of more, um, but I think you know, these are maybe some of the most pressing. So I'll just end by you know, a couple of things that can be done. The first um, is you know, calling, writing to, trying to have a sit down with um, lawmakers. So that includes Andre Dickens, the mayor, um, who actually, as the mayor, um, the way that the lease was written for this project, he could tomorrow decide to pull Atlanta out of the deal. So he actually holds a lot of power here. Um, the city council members you know, also have a, a lot of power when it comes to this. They don't have that same direct, like we can just change it tomorrow, um, but getting in touch with them and you know, both individually and as an organization um, could really have an impact. And then, like I said before, um, getting in touch with the DeKalb County Commission um, and urging them not to give permits to cut down the trees and you know, urging them to take whatever action they're able to is really important. Um, the second is that this movement to stop Cop City um, is really sort of, a, there's no one central organization. There's a lot of people holding protests and doing marches and defending the forest, living in the forest, canvassing in, in neighborhoods. Um, and you can find out about a lot of those activities at defendtheatlantaforest.com. Um, there's a week of action coming up in July. So if you wanted to host a community event where you know you got some speakers to come and do a little bit, uh, education session on Cop City, um, but, you know that would be great. One of the tactics that the, that this sort of movement has taken as well is to pressure contractors and funders who are with the project and say, hey, you know this should not align with your corporate values to help destroy the world, you know destroy the the earth, destroy the forest and replace it with a big police playground. Um, and then the last couple things I'd say are, you know, I think that sort of the, the NAACP name has a lot of power. And so a statement might, you know, might go a long way. Um, and then last, I think everyone should visit the forest. It's a, you know, it's a beautiful forest. It's amazing to walk around in. It's, you know, this really precious place um, that is, you know, by the end of the year could be gone if we don't take the necessary action. Um, so I think that's 18 minutes. So I did it within my 20, um, and I'm happy to take any questions or discussion or you know any anything that anyone wants to talk about. We want to thank you so much. I was trying to, trying to get back off of the mute. I want to thank you so much, Micah, for coming in and being a part of this and then giving the presentation. It's a lot of things to consider that you have within the presentation. So we're gonna fill some questions now. We do have a couple in the chat, but before we do that, I'll ask if anybody wanna come off of mute and ask those questions or ask any question that you may have at this point. Yeah. Oh, okay, go ahead, Karen. Well, uh, isn't this also the area where the Muske Muskogee Creek are uh, organizing and having um, uh, events, shall we say, to celebrate their culture? And and wouldn't it be a good idea if they, this is the same area, and I think it is, to uh, find ways to um, also involve them and, and work with them on, um, uh, basically, you know, they were just possessed of their land and um, African Americans are looking like they're going to be dispossessed of, of, you know, their neighborhood trees, so that maybe there's a way to work together. Yes, that's a that's a great question and a great instinct and that actually is happening. So the, the stomp dance that was hosted there um, in December, that was actually, you know, coordinated in conjunction with the Stop Cup City campaign. Um, and they, um, some, some various representatives actually from multiple different indigenous nations um, have, have visited the forest and, you know, spent time with the organizers. Um, so it's like, you know, like you said, it's been really, it's been really amazing to see sort of this solidarity between all of these groups impacted. And so Micah, um, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Hi, um, I, 
My name is Rhonda, Rhonda go ahead. Mangum, <laughs> and um, I'm a member of the NAACP Cab County also. Micah, uh, I, I, I thank you for your uh, information totally, but I think sometimes when we address some of these injustices, we tend to continue to uh, put a label on predominantly African-American neighborhoods, even though it's not a poor neighbor, poor neighborhood. It may not be affluent as Brookhaven, but I own a home here. I have friends that own homes in unincorporated DeKalb. I think uh, for our area, we shouldn't be labeled as a poor neighborhood, but an unrepresented neighborhood because we are uh, unincorporated. We tried for cityhood over and over and over again. And this is one of the reasons why cityhood is so important. Um, but I just, I just thank you for your uh, information. And it is a public health issue because if these cops are flying around, going around, I fear for my nephews, my niece, even my own body. And I just, I shiver at the thought of seeing these police using us as target practice and maybe even uh, coaching some of our young people to go into their makeshift city and hunt them down like deer. It, it is a nightmare that will come true. And I totally oppose this. Uh, amen for the trees, amen for the water, and the air, but we need to live. We can't, we can't live, we can't navigate. And if they do this, I, I don't know, I don't know. And, and African-Americans, it's a national uh, study that we are the number one consumers in America. I don't know how, we as brown people, can we get together and just freaking boycott all those corporations, pull our money out of Brookhaven and all those other Caucasian neighborhoods that feel like flight and separation is the answer. You know what, let's flight and separate our dollars from their neighborhoods and keep it in our so-called poor neighborhood. I'm just so sick of this over and over and over again. We had a fight and I just thank you as our allies continue fighting, getting bashed over the head with batons and tase to protect my body when we're protesting for police uh, reform. But this is becoming exhaustive and I'm tired. I'm 57 years old. When I was born, my mom, year before, couldn't even vote. And now we're able to vote. But I'm just, I'm just tired. I'm really, really tired. And I don't want this cop city to come into our area. And I don't know why they continue to put deaf ears for us. I, I just, Miss Chartel, I mean, can we try to get a campaign to boycott our, not, not even a boycott, don't spend any dollars. Mm -hmm. Don't spend any dollars. Thank yeah. you, Micah. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> I'm <sighs> actually glad you mentioned that, Rhonda, because I wrote down, um, if you haven't come to our um, economic development committee, you should. Um, our last meeting, we talked about um, uh, businesses coming into, if I'm not mistaken, Stonecrest Mall and creating, you know, like Black Wall Street and things. So that's a good committee to to come to and be a part of so you can learn like where Black businesses are and how we can frequent them and share our dollars um, that way. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm all about it. Absolutely. I tell my family, friends, circles, all of that, that, you know, as best I can to spend my money um, with people who look like me and in their businesses. Um, because if there's a um, 
big business that's doing the service. There's a small black business that's doing it as well. Local black business should not say small, but local black business is doing the same service. So um, I absolutely agree with you. Um, and yeah, I want you to know that. My question is, um, I was looking online as you shared the slide, Micah, of the um, current city council. So my question is, would they have any, because it's different than the county that voted. So would they have any um, sway if people are calling like current city council members to to oppose this or should, I'm sorry, I'm just, I am really angry at the mayor of Atlanta um, just because he gives all of his money to to the police commissioner. And I've got my super strong feelings as well about police and how the, the chokehold that they have on us, pun is intended, um, you know, on, on uh, the American people. So I'm, I am really angry at him and that's where all of my efforts are going. But is there any sway if we contact current city council members or should we be um, reaching Andre, you know, kind of beating down his door, so to speak, because he does have that ability to, to pull, pull the project? Yeah, I would say um, there is the the current council so a new council started at the beginning of 2022 um the current council is probably a little bit more favorable toward stopping the project um but it's still a, it's still a rough um scene <laughs> whereas mm -hmm. yeah i do think you know pressuring mayor dickens um you know because he has such direct power um okay. is, is important. And, and and doing it publicly as well so you know doing the mm -hmm. individual outreach but also showing, you know, you know, con just continuing to hammer home that the public is against mm -hmm. this, um, and he's doing this, you know, while knowing full well that, you know, this is not, you know, this is not what what anyone wants to see, other than, you know, the Atlanta Police Foundation. Absolutely. And, you know, yeah. Okay. So, All right. mm. thank you, Micah. We have a couple of questions inside of the chat. There's one that says isn't there a training center sort of like this in middle georgia i think it's off of 75 south have you all researched that is there any possibility of expanding that one as opposed to doing a cop city here i'm not sure about um about the existence of that training center um i do know that you know they've spoken pretty strongly about you know, having like an Atlanta specific police training center, they do have, you know, their current, their current training center, which, you know, is, is very dilapidated. Um, and that's in many ways, a problem of mismanagement, <laughs> rather than, you know, it's, 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 this is a situation that could have been avoided. Um, but, but yeah, I think that they will continue to push for, you know, an Atlanta specific Thank facility. You, and <laughs> it, it messes again oh, with yeah. quality of life that is uh, with us all, but if it was in a, a different area, then of course is not as much of the activities in the metropolitan area because there's not oh, as many people job. for them to take advantage of. Well, that's that's one thing. And then there's another question that says, do we have any idea who the proposed contractors are for these contracts that, that are planning to work with cop city yes um so one of the major ones right now is brassfield gory um they've been contracted by the atlanta police foundation um if it would be helpful i can i can pull together a list um this the the, the defend the forest you know broad sort of website and, and movement um has has pulled together a lot of those contractors and um, and you know people who are helping finance the project and whatnot. So there have been protests outside of the AT&T AT headquarters because AT&T is supporting the project. So there's really a broad swath of you know of different entities involved. Um, one of the main one of the main um, contractors currently that's doing a lot of, like the site assessments and is sort of on the land is Brassfield and Gory, um, and that's who has sort of been targeted recently, trying to get them to pull out. Um, but, but like I said, if, you know, if you go on the website and if you, um, you know, if you follow, especially them on, on Twitter, they're always putting out different action items of, you know, here you can call this corporation today and leave a message and, you know, ask them to pull out of the project, um, that sort of thing. Okay. Sounds great. It's one of those things where 
if we can get to them, but then of course, if the council members are getting a kickback, that's going to hurt us because that means that the council members are already behind them doing what they can do to get them to build, but it's still fat in their pockets. And I think if they've, you fatten one or two people's pockets, then the rest of us have to suffer as a result of it. There is another question that says, uh, please have more specifics on how DeKalb County can block tree cutting. You can spend some time on that. Sure. Um, so I will say I'm not an expert in this part of it, but my understanding is basically that in order for them to begin cutting trees, even though the deal, um, you know, went, even though this is city owned land um, that is in unincorporated DeKalb County, the county still has to issue the permit for the tree cutting. Um, and so that's another place, I'm, I'm gonna make a list uh, of things to follow, um, but that's another place where, um, you know, the, the movement is trying to pressure the county to not issue those permits to begin that tree cutting. Okay, well, thank you so much. Are there any other questions uh, from the group tonight, from the committee? I think just no a clarification question. point. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's all. Uh, okay. I was just going to say, no question. Yeah, go for it. Thanks for giving us that information. I know about the history, you know, over there. And I really appreciate you bringing it, you know, uh, information to us. Thank you. Thank you. And I just wanted to clarify for the uh, permit that's the DeKalb County Commissioners who we should be reaching out to? Um, I will circle back with you um, for an answer on that. Okay. Because I want to make sure okay, thank you. Right. Okay, thanks. It normally is for permits, the commissioners. Any other questions? Um, can you hear me? My yes, name is Kelsey Hall, and I was late coming on. I just saw it today. I've been listening to the hearing all day, so... I'm just late seeing this uh, announcement uh, for the meeting. Um, what is the zip code for that cop city? I've been hearing about it, but I never knew the zip code for it. I know it's this Atlanta area, but I want to know which zip code is it is. Do you happen to know anybody? It looks like, I just looked it up. It, it looks like 30316. Okay, I, now I know oh. which area uh, it's at. Yeah, that's all I want to know. And it's it, my guess is that probably the forest is is in different zip codes, but that's probably a good anchor point. Yeah, maybe I'll add. Um, this is Bert. Uh, I think it's if you just look in, you know, the part that's in DeKalb County, it's just the bottom left corner of the county, you know, something like that. Okay. That's about where it is. Yeah. I know. I know where it is now. Okay. Thank you. All right, are there any other questions tonight? Well, I might, for those who didn't hear the beginning of it, I might just mention Ted Terry, actually, this was an important point that I think the county has some leverage on and we should be talking, particularly those of us who have, we, those of us who live on the left side of Cab County and have Ted Terry as our uh, commissioner. Uh, he, is, he appointed someone who's an expert in in I think environmental matters and is opposed to this to the to the group that's working on trying to uh, implement it and uh, they threw her out so they were trying to throw her out earlier and apparently just got thrown out tonight so um, I think we're you know he may be the the commissioner to take you know some leadership on this I hope right very good. Any other questions or comments now, either for the group or for? Yes. Go ahead, go ahead, Jim. Okay, so we're successful in getting this overturned. Where do they move it to? Do they just cancel the whole project altogether? Or is there another uh, place that they plan on moving this to? Yeah, so- Is there a plan 20, B, so basically? Sure. 
So back in um, 2017 was when they first, um, or at least the first that we know of, when they first started studying this issue. Um, and they actually did a whole, um, they, they did an assessment of basically what are the options for this facility um, we could, you know, we could renovate our current one or we could build. And basically they looked at a bunch of different, um, a bunch of different places and made a recommendation for, um, for, for this facility. So for, or for this location. So I'm sure that they do have backup sites in mind. Um, if, you know, if, if this didn't go through, maybe it would end up being a renovation versus, um, you know, uh -huh. building a new site entirely. So it's, it's really up in the air as to, to what the alternative would be, but they have looked at, you know, various possibilities and ultimately back in 2017 was, you know, we, the public didn't hear about any of this until 2021, which is part of sort of the, you know, the, um, it's all been sort of happening in shadows, um, but this plan has been in the works for a long time. Okay. Anyone else tonight? Just of course, want to express my gratitude again, Micah, for coming to speak with us on this um, matter. We really appreciate your insight and knowledge about it. And I hope everyone feels as um, activated as I do to get this um, not built in our community. So I hope we can all share in this. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And I dropped my email in the chat. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to reach out. Awesome. Yeah. Mike, we I'm want sorry. to thank you again. Go ahead, Rhonda. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Vic. I apologize. Hey, Micah, uh, with some of the stories that's been coming out as far as like uh, protesters throwing Molotov cocktails at the police and becoming violent, like, like dogs or something towards authority, and I know this is misinformation and, and just hyperbolic crap that they're doing. What can we do as far as new protesters coming aboard um, and trying to dispute, diffuse some of the uh, anger that people may display? Um, or is there like a meeting like, hey guys, we're getting ready to go out to protest these are the do's and the don'ts while the police and media may be there. Do, do you have a like a training session for such a large scale type of protest like this? We don't have, well, we do have like a, you know, like a know your rights training for, you know, if you are in a protest and if you are arrested, that sort of thing. Um, not necessarily a do and don't. Um, when, whenever there's a protest going on, we always try to have legal observers there. So someone who's sort of, you know, deciding to become a neutral third party and just observing what's happening to protect the rights of people who are involved. Um, you know, as, as far as sort of, you know, the, the way that the media has reported, you know, the, of course, they always are going to draw out, you know, whatever act they identify as violent, and they're going to paint that as the face of the movement, as I, you know, as I know you know. Um, and, you know, what I'll say is that Something, you know, I, I'm not sure the full extent of what's happened, you know, in the forest. I've been a part of, you know, marches that were held with preschoolers who held little signs that said, don't cut down the trees. And so there's really just been this, this broad range of, um, of movements. And I would say, you know, as, as folks new to it, um, I think that it probably just, you know, my, my understanding that is not based on any personal witnessing, you know, whatever, I, I'm just trying to give all the disclaimers is that whatever I've seen reported on the media, my understanding is that that's only been reported as having having, having have happened in the fort, like in sort of the, the ground zero of the okay. site. And so I think if you weren't, if you weren't there, you wouldn't have to worry about, you know, whether those things have happened or not, you wouldn't have to worry about it. Okay, because yeah. usually I don't go <laughs> out, yeah, usually I don't go out into the forest because um, I'm afraid of mosquitoes, spiders, yeah. any type of bugs other than ladybugs. <laughs> but so this will be like a my first like nature type of protest, but also environmental racism um, also is present in our preservation of our lives from these police yeah. officers. But thank you. 
Yeah, thank you. And I also wonder too, is if you're going out and like attending protests, just kind of maybe just speaking to people at large too about like also call Mayor Andre because he can, you know, pull the project with, you know, signage. So I think also maybe just educating people that you run into or in a counter with that piece also. Thanks, Chartel, because yeah, I'm no gonna problem. get on that tonight. <laughs> yes, no problem. I'm I'm getting, I'm gearing up too. Amazing. This is a partnership between Atlanta and La Fulton and DeKalb, is that right? So it's actually, um, so this is, this land is city owned land in unincorporated DeKalb. So it's not actually land that DeKalb County owns. Um, and so the, the official deal is actually that um, the city of Atlanta leased this land to the Atlanta Police Foundation. So the people who are actually in control of the land is now the Atlanta Police Foundation. Um, and they have raised $60 million in private funds for the project. And the city of Atlanta is putting up $30 million. So it's a $90 million price tag on this facility. Um, and Atlanta is you know, putting up a third of it. But it's, it, is, it is Atlanta owned land. Okay. All right. Well, Micah, again, thank you for coming. I'm not sure if there's any other questions, but if there's not, we were so glad to have you tonight. Very good education for us with the Cop City. And our hope and our prayer is that in some way, shape or form, we might be able to do enough to the mayor and others in DeKalb County to get this to at least stop or in Rhonda's case to relocate because that will be good for us, especially when we're trying to save our, our forest.